don't, you don't want to, oh yeah, go ahead. Thank the production team, little show offs. I said, hey, give us a bumper about heavenly peace, this new series we're doing, and that's what they came up with. So that probably describes uh, many of your uh, holidays and what it feels like. I'm so glad that you're here today. We're excited to get into our series, which I'll do in just a few moments. But I wanted to make you aware, something that came to my heart this morning, I talked myself out of it and I walked down the first service and the first uh, hand that I shook, he said, hey, I've I've been wanting to get a copy of your book. So I would felt the Holy Spirit told me to mention it this morning. Someone has made available um, my book for $5. You can pick these up in the coffee shop. It's a verse by verse description of David and Goliath. And there may be people that you want to uh, give a gift uh, at Christmas, maybe they have all kinds of stuff, but, but personal growth would be one of the things you want to think about. All of the money, so I don't see any of the money, uh, all of the money goes to buying Bibles for children around the world. How's that? So even the $5 that you give will go to do that. So, uh, so the book is half price uh, through, uh, actually we're going to make it available even into January so that you can help people grow. We're focused on on growing, and that's what we're actually going to focus on in January as well, that God would accelerate his activity in your life. Well, I want to get right into the message today, and as we think about uh, um, this first Sunday of the month of December, we're in Advent now, and that basically means on the church calendar that it's that time when, when we begin to prepare our hearts for the coming of the Lord, uh, the miracles that happen as you think about all that went on during the time right before Christ was born. And uh, so I want us to enter into this Heavenly Peace series, thinking about, uh, thinking about that. And then our, our topic uh, today, uh, I've shifted just a little bit as far as uh, what I wanted to talk about because of the events of, uh, and the things that are happening in contemporary culture around us uh, with the uh, allegations, the sexual abuse allegations, all these kinds of things that are happening. Uh, many of them are, are factual uh, uh, things that are being presented. And it's really kind of under, it's uncovering kind of the underbelly of, uh, of, of American society. And we're seeing, we're seeing kind of the fruits of, uh, of what the, the 1960s and 70s kind of planted. And I, I think we're, we're watching uh, with, with, um, with heartbroken uh, eyes uh, what's happening around the country. And so I kind of wanted to uh, get into this idea today and talk about uh, what it means for us and how to think about the idea of holiness or as I've laid out uh, this and I want to make sure I associate the word wholeness with it. So some of us were raised in a holiness tradition. So I come out of a holiness tradition, a, a tradition that had certain guidelines, certain rules. You could do this, couldn't do that, uh, certain things. And some were more uh, strict than others. Uh, our big thing was you don't uh, smoke, drink, or chew, or run with girls who do. You know, uh, maybe you had maybe you had a little different one in the, where you grew up, but uh, those kinds of things. But now for you, you you never arrive at the place where you look in the mirror and go, "Now you are holy." <laughs> That's just not going to happen to you. Now, if that has happened to you, please come forward right now. It's not going to happen. You don't. It, it's not like a destination. It's not like you catch the holiness train and then get off at a destination, go, oh, this is the town of holiness. Here I am, and this is where I'm going to live. And it's not like that. So how, how we think about and how I thought about holiness, I think had, had weird tentacles to it. You know, one of those was you need to fast more. You just fast. Well, I didn't used to look like this, you know. I, I, I'm twice the man now that I was back in the day, you know. Uh, but people would think, oh, if you just fast more, or if you, if you just can uh, read your Bible more, if you just read your Bible more, you just pray more, if you can just pray more, anytime somebody in, in spiritual circles, when they mention the word more, uh, flags should go up for you. Because more, more is not necessarily going to address what's really going on. So some, maybe some to, to really to really step up, step up of the disciplines, the spiritual disciplines in your life. And I'm not downing those. You need discipline in your life and you need to set you know, guidelines and, and hit those goals that you have for yourself and all of that. But that won't produce holiness. You could, you could be the most disciplined person in the world and still not be holy. Holiness is not an attribute that you're gonna be able to acquire. And so I wanna just talk us through this. Uh, um, it's something that... Something that 
that we can come to. And I, I want us to understand that uh, God wants to impact all the areas in our life. And so one of the best ways to think about holiness is to think the word wholeness and to keep that word wholeness clearly in our mind. Um, I remember pastoring my first church and, and uh, when, when you pastor a small church, you, you end up doing everything. And I had just enough seminary to make me dangerous at that point. So people that, uh, people that wanted um, pastoral counseling would come and see me. And they had marriage trouble. They'd come see me. And so it was a smaller church. So I, I knew everybody's business. Made it a lot harder to preach on Sunday mornings because almost every passage would offend somebody else. And they'd go, oh, he's just playing. He heard me say that. Now he's preaching that right at me, you know. So Anyway, uh, don't sign up this week. Uh, I don't do counseling anymore. I learned in my first church. That's why I had to leave my first church. Are you kidding? I'd still be there if I hadn't counseled people. Okay. It's, y'all have been that way the whole morning, so I'm just going to plow right ahead. And So uh, people would come in, and they would, they would come in, and inadvertently one, one spouse would say, you know, well, I wish we had the kind of marriage, you know, that the Smith family has, you know, who attended the church on the other side of the church. And what I found is all the marriages compared themselves to one another. But then the Smith family would come see me and they were like really messed up. <laughs> but I couldn't say anything to the Jones family because that violates the rules. rules. So, so, you know, Sister Jones thinks if I could just have a husband like, you know, Sister Smith, I'm like, you don't want that. You don't want that. <laughs> Trust me. I mean, I got the scoop on for that. And what I came to find out over five and a half years of listening to all these stories I, I, I have an announcement. Everybody's messed up. The whole world is messed up. <laughs> you say, I, I don't know, I don't have a good marriage. I know, nobody does. Well, I mean. I was just trying to be authentic, that's all. I was just. Over the years, I've come to the conclusion that everybody's broken. I mean, the only thing about you're not married and you are married is that now, instead of being one broken person looking to get fixed, now you're two people that are broken fighting. <laughs> God bless you. That's all I have, that's all I have for today. I have nothing else. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. You know the story well, but we often, I think, miss the bigger point. He's talking to Jewish people, and he says to them, there was a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, a 17-mile trip, and he fell among thieves and robbers and ended up in the ditch. And as Jesus is telling the story to these Jewish listeners, they're hearing it, and the, Jesus says, but a priest came by, and all the listeners would have been hopeful in their heart. Oh, good, a priest is coming by. They would have identified with the priest. The priest comes by and looks, but then he doesn't stop and help. And he goes on, and the Jewish listener would have been like, oh, well, the priest should have helped. And then Jesus says, but a Levite is coming by. Oh, they're all excited again. Okay, we can identify with the Levite. Here comes the Levite, but then the Levite doesn't help, and their shoulders drop again, and they're like, wow, the Levite didn't help. And then Jesus says, and a Samaritan passed by, and they're like, Samaritans, we hate Samaritans. And Jesus says, and this Samaritan helped the one in the ditch, and took care of him and, and, and put him in a place. You know the story. In other words, Jesus had put them in such a corner that the only person in the story that they could really identify with was the person in the ditch. Let me make the application for you. Jesus is saying, you guys have done all the religious rules. You do everything right. You are, you are disciplined beyond disciplined, but your spirituality is in the ditch. He wanted them to identify and admit. So the first thing right out of the gate this morning, I need to say to you, if you want to be holy, if you want to be a whole person, you have to admit that all of your fasting, all of, your, all of the discipline you've tried, all the books you've read, everything, everything is going to let you down and, unless you first admit that you're in the ditch that you're in need of rescue, that you're in need of a savior. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount left us with these words, wonderful news for the poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven is yours. 
Wonderful news for the mourners, you're going to be comforted. Wonderful news for the meek, you're going to inherit the earth. Wonderful news for the people who hunger and thirst for God's justice, you're going to be satisfied. Wonderful news for the merciful, you will receive God's mercy for yourselves. Wonderful news for the pure in heart, for you will see God. Wonderful news for the peacemakers, you'll be called God's children. Wonderful news for the people who are persecuted because of God's way, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. So when I would hear this, when I heard blessed are those that, that uh, have a pure in heart for they will see God, I would think, I, I want a pure heart. I want to see God. I long to see God, but I don't have a pure heart. How can I get a pure heart? But that's not what Jesus is meaning in this uh, Sermon on the Mount. He's not saying if you can manage to behave in a certain way, you'll be rewarded by seeing God. But we, we inadvertently think that that's what Jesus meant because we are, we are doers and we like to have power and control. So if Jesus, you just tell me what to do, I'll do it and then we're good. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Wonderful news for the pure in heart, you will see God. What Jesus is saying here is rather, now that I'm here, God's new world is coming to birth. And once you realize that, you'll see that these are the habits of heart which help you to show God's kingdom here and now. Let me say it again, because it's not on the screen. Now that I'm here, God's new world is coming to birth. And once you realize that, you'll see that these are the habits of heart, which help you to show God's kingdom here and now. In other words, you can be pure hearted actually today. And, but you'll have to start over again tomorrow. The pure heartedness comes from not only recognizing that your best efforts are in a ditch, but it's the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit that helps you to live with a desire for God, that you long for God in your life. You see, what I learned many years ago, actually pastoring the church uh, uh, during that season when I was doing all this counseling, there was a revelation and I realized that God had created humanity for dignity, that he wanted us to live uh, full of human dignity that was found in him. And outside of him, there would be, there would be uh, no dignity, a struggle out, outside of that, that we need to see the people around us. I don't care, God followers or not God followers, we need to see all of the people around us as, as the dignity of God reflected back to us, that God is in them. And what I noticed is that there are two big areas that every person struggles with. Uh, whether they're a 20-something working their way through school uh, or they have a job or whether you're married, been married a long time, the two areas uh, of struggle were what we saw with Adam and Eve, that there, was, there would be a struggle in the area of your sexuality and there would be a struggle in the area of your vocation or your job or money. Those two areas, and probably more than anything else, those two areas are the level, those are the conflicted areas in in living in a marriage, that those are the two most sensitive areas and the two areas that'll cause the biggest arguments. In the same way, if we're not careful, those are the two areas we actually hide from God. Somehow we can do the church thing and the religious thing, but the areas that we hide from God are actually the two areas that need him the most, our money and our sexuality. So to really grow in the Lord and be all that he wants us to be and to reach our fullest and highest potential, we need to invite the Lord into our sexuality and we need to invite the Lord into our money. We need, we need to give him lordship. We need to let him show us the dignity in both of those and the way in which that he has compelled us and, and calls us to grow. Uh, I, I wanna do a quick a little sidebar because I think it may help some that uh, have grown up in the church a while that, that struggle in this area of discipline and thinking about holiness and wholeness. Uh, 260 years ago when, when America and around the, around the world, but uh, certainly here in America, we saw the move from, from uh, being a farming culture and economy to an industrial economy, a mechanized economy. Uh, and so to really expand, to really have a successful business then and make products, it no longer was a farm where you raised uh, food and that sort of thing, but it was also more about uh, um, producing. So factories or businesses, they developed boards of directors. 
the late 1800s, and they would buy up land and buildings. And so land and buildings became the main thing until about 60 years ago. And about 60 years ago, uh, when, when um, um, knowledge really started to, to uh, explode and uh, the nanotechnology and computer chips and and, uh, and microchips, and you know, there's more memory. There's more memory in my cell phone uh, than there were in in our in our first computer we had in our house. Uh, the 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 world has gotten smaller in some ways. The technology, but what happened is we thought in the church. We thought in the church if we could just buy, build bigger buildings, have more land, we would be a successful church, and we would produce. As a factory, we would produce better Christians, that we would give them the information. And so we had factory trying to put out factory churches, and it created little robots. And so, so people, people try to live out very robotic lives. You, you know, don't smoke, drink, or chew, or run with girls who do. Okay, and now I'm holy. And, but then, and then whatever, whatever factory or however the, the elements that went into producing holiness for that particular denomination. So you have whole denominations, whole systems of, of religion and thought that developed around this, this uh, very secular premise, which is buy, buy more land, have bigger land, and, 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 and put white people in charge or whatever. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very dangerous time. And then you come along and, and you see in the, in the 60s and the revolutions that are happening. And, and one of the one of the bad revolutions that happened in the, the sexual revolution uh, was so uh, prominent. Uh, I, I, wasn't, uh, I was born in the 60s, but I, uh, I wasn't aware in the 60s. But, uh, but history shows us that the church was pretty silent on sexuality. Other than screaming, screaming from big buildings and big pulpits, there, were, there was no, like, you, you had stuff happening in the church just as well as outside the church. And the same is true today, isn't it? Well, what we'll do, what we'll find is that we just add a little bit of Jesus onto whatever it is that we're doing, and we're just going to live like we want to live anyway. So we just pray a little prayer, listen to a little music, try to cry a little tear once a month. But, but, but wholeness comes from this person, this person being whole, and you can, you can see that that wasn't the case. So uh, that little sidebar is only to say you don't want your mindset of holiness to be shaped around whether it's mechanistic or even knowledge management and move, moving into now this, uh, into this computer age and, uh, you know, uh, to say, well, we don't know for sh- all knowledge comes from somewhere, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to digress too far. So let me, let me bring it down to this. To experience holiness in your life, we need to make sure we define what we're talking about. Wholeness is the kingdom of God becoming birthed or being lived through you each day. That God's plan will be fully realized with the new heaven and the new earth. But until then, we are to be uh, evidences or the fruit of this. And so the way Jesus taught and lived was to announce that God was already becoming king. He was already king. But now the kingdom had come to the earth so that God has always been in charge. But Jesus showed up and said, you have a different kind of a king that's not trying to not trying to produce holiness in you. He is holiness. He's inviting you to travel to him, to journey with him, to do life with him, that he would walk with you so that your life is a visual retelling of the Exodus story. You remember the Exodus story They're in captivity under a wicked ruler, they cry out for help, they're rescued by a sacrificial leader, freedom is declared, a different and better life as they uh, head out, as they leave Egypt, uh, God's abiding presence continually headed to the promised land, and they follow the cloud or the leading of the Lord. And that's your story and my story. So we are in a ditch, we cry out for help. So think about this, Luke chapter four, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus reads this. Uh, or, uh, and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be free. And if you really examine that word oppressed, let me do it for you. He came to announce that the one who was attached, the one that was broken, the one that was trapped, the one that was addicted, the one that was overwhelmed, 
the one that was unwhole emotionally, the one that was unwell in their experience of what it meant to be human, that person had been set free. So Jesus was announcing the start of a new kingdom. There's a kingdom here on earth. God's kingdom had come to earth, and now you and I have become a part of God's kingdom. So Jesus comes, announces a new leader, uh, uh, and Jesus says, believe the good news. What is the good news? The good news is you, the oppressed, have been set free. The difference between you and me as followers of Jesus than everybody else in the country that uh, is struggling, the only difference should be this, that the life of Christ is functioning in us, and every day he lifts us up out of the ditch of what we were in our past and shows us a path to walk of what we can be as we walk and are empowered by him. And so Jesus announces this and calls us. Remember, Jesus uh, um, set captives free, healed the blind. He said, the Lord's favor has come. And Jesus identified with Zacchaeus. He sat down with prostitutes. He ate frequently with sinners. Uh, these folks were his target. Look to your neighbor and say, oh, I feel better now. Look to your neighbor. Because that's us. You're not Pharisees. You're this other list. But we don't like to admit we're the other list. Why? Because of spiritual pride. But, but we, don't, we don't look to the world and say, yeah, we got it all together. We look to the world and say, we're just as broken as you, but we have found freedom in Jesus, and we're just humbly trying to walk this out. We're just trying to live for the Lord as best we can, right? So holiness is never owned by you, but rather is the highway you travel on to the promises of God. So the Israelites, tell me when, we, when were they free, when they got to the promised land or when they left Egypt? When they left Egypt, they were free. What was the problem for those 40 years between Egypt and the, whole, and the promised land? They were the problem. They weren't thinking rightly about themselves. And often you don't think rightly. You say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not pure in heart. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not pure in heart. I'll never be pure in heart. No, that's not true. You're pure in heart right now. It, you're in church, first of all. And what that means is you came seeking the Lord. Unless your wife or husband drug you here and blackmailed you to get you in the building, you were holy. Because once you begin seeking the Lord, once you begin uh, inviting him to be in the center of your life, that's when you are the most holy in your life. It's in that moment. It's like a prayer for holiness, a prayer for wholeness. Lord, make me whole. Your wholeness is not about living more religious, but rather caring about the things that God cares about. Luke eleven nine, 9, and so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking and the door, what are you saying? Every day, every day, Lord, help me with this. Amen. See, what we want is we need a microwave God, really. If we could do that, can I get, can I get deeper spirituality like in about, you know, I mean, um, I'll, give it, I'll give it 90 seconds. Can we do that? I mean, that's often why people want the miraculous in their life because they don't have to do the work, you know? So this is why I don't do counseling anymore. Somebody come back in the day. Now, this was a church built on cigarettes. So I, I, you can't pick on cigarettes here. We, okay. I mean, when we took the offering, nobody went, was there any, was there any cigarette money in that offering? I don't think anybody was thinking that. Woo, I squashed the class turtle right there, didn't I? <laughs> well, let's just pick another church. Somebody come to me and say, you know, Pastor, I, you know, I just uh, I didn't need counseling. I want to quit smoking. This is why I don't make a good counselor. I'm like, okay, well, then stop. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm struggling. Okay, well, keep struggling. I thought you said you want to stop. Well, then stop. See, I'm not good at this. So all the psychologists in here are going, I'm not good at this. But what I have found in my own personal life, there have been things that I wanted to stop, that I said I was going to stop, 
and then I didn't stop. And then I come back to the Lord. But the Lord doesn't say, I thought you said you was going to stop. The Lord doesn't work like that. The Lord is saying, why don't, why don't we work together today to live the life you were called to live today? Right? Why don't we partner together today? And that becomes, that becomes wholeness. So holiness is not produced by a church or at a church, but churches produce atmospheres where you're awakened to the fact you're in a ditch and you need the empowerment of God to help you get out of that. Now watch this. Watch this. Luke eleven twenty four. 24. The Bible has just exploded the last couple of months. Don't miss January. I'm, I'm telling you right now that the, uh, I'm, I'm actually, we're going to deliver two e-courses uh, online. I'm just saying it. We're going to make these available to you. If you're uh, be free to, to the people that attend our church. Two e-courses, one on awakening your inner life, the second one on psychic uh, um, storms that the Lord has given me. Two, two uh, 10 minute, I'm gonna do 10 minute devotionals and just try to, you know, the average Christian reads like their Bible, you know, like a couple of minutes a year, you know. So I, I wanna help you, I wanna bring this. But anyway, so I was reading this in Luke eleven twenty four, 24 and this is what the Spirit just brought to my mind. Uh, it's the context. He's casted out demons and they're in a conversation about this. Luke eleven twenty four. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. I read that and I went, oh, I get it. See, sometimes as Christians, we feel demonized. Demonized for me and the definition of being demonized would be just feels like you're just being chased. Like you can't, like wherever you go, it's like, like stop it. Like everywhere you go, this is good. But it also could be mindset, right? It could be mindset. But do you know what demons are, their whole ministry is about? Making you restless. Because they're looking for rest. The bad part about being a demon is they'll never find rest. Did you know a demon can't reproduce? They're sterile. There are no more demons now that in, in, the, in the world and any of, uh, in the spirit world than there were at the time of Jesus or at the time of Joseph or Abraham. Uh, now, I know the demonic realm hate when I just kind of sh- reveal that. Do you know why? Because with the way the planet has progressed in our population, if we could just get a few Christians to let their light shine before men, it would so overpower the darkness, the darkness would disappear. If Christians could actually love people of other religions, it would go a long ways. You are different. You are different. You're not of a religion, you're of a person who's compelled us to walk. They didn't call the holy land, holy land, till Jesus went back to heaven. They didn't call it the holy land. It was the promised land. Then Jesus comes and embodies the message of holiness, what it means to be holy. And now we're like, oh, that's the holy land. Why? Because Jesus was there. Nobody shows up and says, hey, can I go to Herod's place? Do you want to see where Jesus walked? Because somehow he has called out the better part of us. He's, He's calling us higher and better. Anyway, sorry, I'm nearing the end. Okay, so actually what I want to do, is if, you are, if you've been having a hard time sleeping at night, like you are just like, just, uh, I just want you to kind of open your hands. I was going to have you stand, but then it would be too many of you. Just kind of open your hands like this. Just kind of open your hands like this. If you are just struggling to sleep at night. Father, in Jesus' name, I speak, if any of these are being attacked by the evil one or evil thoughts or any kind of demonic activity and they cannot sleep and they are restless, I cancel that. I break that off of them. They will sleep deep tonight. Pray you would give them a dream deep in the night about how much you love them, how much you care for them, how much you long for them to know your heavenly peace. (laughs) Just breathe real deep and receive that. See, the, the, the message of holiness 
got lost because we put it inside the message of culture was if you work hard, you can accomplish anything. Or we put it inside the message of education. If you'll just get smarter in the Bible, you'll be fine. And both of those are dead ends. The only thing that makes you holy is that the righteousness of Christ be blanketed upon your soul every day. You are the righteousness of Christ. It's not a once and for all done deal in that sense. It's a sense of this getting up every day saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you today. You say, yeah, but you don't know the addictions in my life. I don't know. I, and I, even in prayer this morning, I felt like some of you have been saying in your own minds, nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody understands the complexity of my situation. And nobody can get inside my personal pain. It's just too, it's just too complicated. And the truth is that actually, maybe there's a lot of truth to that. But I do know one who is already there who's already on the inside. And if you'll listen to his voice, he'll empower you. He'll soften your heart if it's hurting. If you're a woman and you've been on the other side of abuse, if you've been abused, if you've been spoken to harshly, if you've been treated poorly, or if you've even been sexually assaulted, I pray that the Spirit of Christ would come over you in this moment and would begin that healing process as you walk it out, the, the healing process. But in this moment, I, I pronounce you holy in Jesus. That in Jesus, you are, you are his daughter. And I, I just pray that no, uh, no mindset that the enemy would try to form, whether it be anger or rage or even murder, that, that all of that would leave and that the Spirit of Christ would come upon you. If you're a man in this room, you absolutely struggle with your sexuality. It's just as it's a part. I don't, I don't know that it's any greater than it was when King David was king, but it's certainly more accessible in our world than it's ever been. And it's probably even going to be even more accessible in the decades to come should Jesus not return yet. So I would just say to the men in this room, let us, let us be the men that God wants us to be. To keep, our, to keep our pathway clear, to, our feet would carry us to where the Lord would want us to go, not be disappointed in us, that we would please the Lord in every dimension of our lives. And I pray that you would find wholeness in the deepest core of who you are, that you would find your identity in Jesus, that the, that the message of holiness is a message for us. It's a message... Uh, you know, it is a message for our culture, but they're not listening. The Lord will have to speak to culture. I can't, I can't fix culture. I can only really address Mike. And you can only address you. But if we could get to that place where the Holy Spirit is welcome in our personal lives, then holiness is a result. Or as I've said, and it's more, I think it's even really appropriate to say wholeness that in my mind, in my emotions, in my body, I am whole. As I was walking the dog this morning, I remember this scripture. I would that you would, above all things, prosper. I thought about that as I was walking Sweet Pea this morning. And I want you to prosper. I want there to be in the morning when you wake up, a sense of all of the investment that Jesus made here on this planet is accessible to you by his spirit. So we have a new king. He came and offered us a new kingdom and we are different because he's here. And so somehow, Lord, somehow, Lord, help us now in this moment. Why don't we stand? We're gonna conclude with just, Whitney's just gonna sing a few phrases over us and Sing with her if you know it. If you don't, just drink it in, and then I'm going to have a closing prayer in a few moments. There's a power in her worship, and I don't quite understand it. When we start to raise our voices, the world around us changes. There's a power. So glory, 
You know, I'm reminded, uh, I was just reminded while we are standing here, when I was, uh, when I was a young, young pastor, there would come seasons of um, attack sexually. We would talk a little bit about it, but uh, I would drive by a sign. It might, you know, be advertising something, and this voice would say, you're going to be like all those other preachers. You're going to fall, you know. But that's three decades ago now. It's not that I can't fall now, but with God's help, I won't fall. You know, I'll live the life he wants me to live. But I think sometimes, I think sometimes, especially back then, because it was hard learning the, it was, I was struggling to learn the Lord's voice and the enemy knew how to, the enemy knows so much Bible, he can trick you real easy. You know, I think Amen. so much, honestly. I mean, you look back to things maybe, and, and probably a lot of you have been following the Lord for a long time. You can look back to things that used to be a challenge, maybe for you, that you've overcome, and they're not anymore. Yes. I think so much has to do just honestly with our relationship with God. Focus on the relationship with God. Focus on your love for God. It, 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 you know, ways of doing things can become religious law rituals yeah. but love and doing the things out of love and making a practice out of talking to God worshiping God because you love him reading his word or getting the devotional book and investing in your spiritual life the way that you invest you in so many areas other areas That's of right. your life you know that you think are important I think more than anything it just has to do with um, desire because the truth is is. What we want, we do. We do. We go so I, you know, yeah, I talk to God about that. I would say talk to God about that. If you don't have a desire to, for things that you need to have a desire for, whatever it be, talk to God about that because He can put those desires in you. I think it's it, that first thing you said. Admit your lack. Yeah. Admit you're the person in the ditch. That's the whole message. Yeah, because I think nobody, uh, you know, those religious people don't want to admit that they're the person in the ditch. But when we can all go, okay, you know what? I'm the person in the ditch wholeness. that needs wholeness and I need God's help. That's, that's where we need to live is I can't do this without God. I think the, <laughs> you know? the biggest, amen. I think it's different for everybody. But for me, the biggest sin, as it turned out in my life, that I had to overcome was the sense of despondency, of putting so much effort into becoming a man of God, into becoming holy and study and discipline, and yet still seeing these really dark crevices in my inner life it w was very overwhelming. And I went through a period, this is many years ago, but I went through a period of real despondency. I couldn't sing. I would say Jacob became Israel. And God knew the journey that, and the things that needed to occur in his life to get him to be who he was at the end of his life. And, and I think sometimes we don't want the process. We just want. Right. <laughs> but part of living life and our failures and our struggles and all those things, if we allow them to work in our life, are, the, are what make us in. And, and, you know, I don't know how old Jacob was when he really became Israel. God called him Israel early on, but it was like a, a years of going through stuff that the circumstances that he went through created in him a, a God. I really believe in the end of his life, he was a whole man, a holy man. He was that. But it, it is allowing that process, staying in humility. I really do. I think, and, and some of us just want to go to A to Z. You know, and I think you're one of those people. Surely there's a way to get from A to Z right. overnight. Right. And it's going to be, well, what, what I do is going to make it happen instead of the process and the circumstances. Well, I thought that's what they called revival. You know what I mean? Seriously. If I could get in a revival service, that would just make me. And what I realized, the formation, like you said, was a relationship. Yes, and the circumstances, God orders things into our life that shape us when we go through them with him. The, the important thing is keep getting back up and, and stay engaged in the relationship with the Lord and know that he is working That's all That's revival. Things. Staying, yeah. get back up, get back up, get back Getting up, get back, back up. up, get back up. That's God's activity in your life. Yeah, God, don't, don't give up. The Lord is at work in you and trust the process. Uh, 
Stay engaged with him. Stay engaged in church. Stay engaged in uh, relationship, yeah. in the atmosphere, in his presence. And trust the process that you are being changed. You'll be better next year than you were this year if you stay engaged with the Lord. And more and more things break off of our life. And we become more and more like Christ. I really do feel like we, we do. I mean, I bet, I bet the Billy Graham of 90 is a, a lot different man, man than the Billy Graham of 20. When he was 20 years old you know i mean you know and the in the process and the things that happened that no, change and true. shape us you know we want to be i think what i've learned is god would god would a lot rather have you fall into silly fleshly sins than to be so pridefully arrogant you can't hear anything because when you fall you know you need help right when you fall in and the, the ditch. And the Lord's like, okay, now yes. we can talk again. Good. Yeah, oh, well, is that your reputation? Well, don't worry about that. Yeah. The uh, fall in the was ditch can anyway. be good. Yes, because in the ditch we cry out for That's help. Right. And so the ditch is not so bad a place sometimes because it's there we go, oh God, oh God, I need you. Right? So Thomas Merton said to beat any kind of a sin, insert the besetting sin in your life in this slot, to overcome that sin, you have to just love God. And uh, just Make put God that first. The focus. So that's really what it means. Uh, and uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That there is a single-eyed focus upon the Lord, and that purifies you. Well, we're we're preaching Amen. message number two. We're about done. Whitney, yeah. did you have any thoughts on this? No. Not at all. You're just bless the folks. You ready for me to <laughs> ready for me to bless them and let them go watch football? Bless them. Yes. What <laughs> does anybody get the rankings yet? Did you get the rankings? Anybody? Oh, is that supposed to happen before church is College, over? yeah, supposed to be college Just yell football. it out. Who's number one, no, two, or three? Come no, on. because if you do, if you do, is it? God. Oh, yeah, that's, see, that's it. God is number one. <laughs> there you go. Woo! <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I got to tell you, my heart is on fire with the power of God, so don't take this lightly what I'm getting ready to do. The Holy Spirit has come on me these last couple months. She's seen it. Something something unique. Whoever's been praying for me, keep it up. Stuff is happening. Some powerful stuff. The anointing's even coming in the room as I speak. Faith is arising in the room. Things are happening in hearts. I've never been worried about the crowds in this room. The only room I want crowd is, is that intimate closet with Jesus. You crowd that up every day and you spend time with him and I will have been a great shepherd.